خب بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم امروز روز شنبه هست فیل ده همه بردی به اشماع ازار و جلسه هشتم درس زمین آمار در خدمت عزیزم هست Perhaps it might be to have a brief discussion of what we have in our previous lectures on Monday and then move to the next step, which is Varigiramad. If you remember, we try to have a general problem statement saying we are given a single partial realization of a random function and then we are asked to estimate the attribute under consideration at the point which is not sum. That is the general problem statement. And then we argue that if we want to solve this problem, we have to consider three steps. Exploratory spatial data analysis, variogram modeling, and then estimation. For the last two or three session, we focus on exploratory spatial data analysis. The first topic that we consider was univariate description in univariate description we ignore the spatial variation as if and instead of having a single partial realization of the random function we have a multiple realization of a single random variable and then we consider these multiple realization of a single random variable to be purely random. Trying to prepare histogram, probability plots, touch on measure of location, measure of dispersion, measure of skewness, measure of pertussis, and so on. And then for this part, we argue that the book written by Isaac on introduction to geostatistics, as well as the book written by Kitandis on introduction again to geostatistics, would help to dig further into univariate description. And we gave a 14-page document or share a 14 page document to you via email touching on exploratory spatial data analysis. And if you have a chance to look at the manual of RGIS, there is a module in RGIS, so-called geostatistical modules. And in that document, again, you have a bunch of material on exploratory spatial data. Then when it comes to multivariate or bivariate distribution of our data, it seems that instead of having a single partial realization of a random function, we have more than one random function. And we would like to consider if there is any correlation between our primary variable, say, precipitation, and secondary variable say elevation. We argue that we have to have two conditions for justifying co creating instead of creating. The very first condition is to have a common information between primary variable and secondary variable. That is the first condition. The second condition concerned with ease of monitoring the secondary variable compared to primary variable. For sure, you could justify 
co-creating for estimating precipitation given precipitation and elevation or estimating suspended solid being able to have both suspended solid and turbidity and when it comes to groundwater hydrology you could go ahead and talk about estimating piezometric head assuming that you would like to consider your piezometric head to be primary variable and hydraulic conductivity or storativity or transmissibility to be your secondary variable. And then quantitatively by bivariate discussion we try to talk about QQ plots. In QQ plots we consider each point on your QQ plot to share the same probability of accidents. It really doesn't matter whether you have the same data set on primary variable and secondary variable. Your secondary variable could contain N stations and your secondary variable could have very different, such as M station. They could be either co-located or not co-located, having the same spatial location, when you want to prepare your Q plot. And by QQ plot, you could manage to touch on nature of probability density function or cumulative distribution function which could be attributed to each variable or random function. And then we talked about PP plots. In PP plots, we try to map probability of accidents for both primary variable and secondary variable. And each data point on our PP plot will share the same spatial location. It's quite important to have acknowledge that. QQ plot will be contrasted with PP plot based on the nature of common information. In QQ plot, each data point share common probability of accidents. In PP plot, each point share special location instead of probability of accidents. In fact, probability of accidents is very different for each data point in PP plot, while it is the same in QQ. And then we talk about Pearson correlation coefficient, or traditionally we call coefficient of correlation in statistics. And finally we talk about Spearman correlation coefficient. Both Pearson correlation coefficient and Spearman correlation coefficient should share the same spatial location. In Pearson correlation coefficient, you will try to compute correlation coefficient using original data. In Spearman correlation coefficient or rank correlation coefficient, you will try to compute coefficient of correlation using the rank instead of the original values. In our, on our Mondays, for which number of students did not manage to take part in our class, we touch on the spatial description. When it comes to spatial description, at first, we try to touch on nature of data. Because when it comes to spatial description, we could talk about nature of spatial data. What do I mean by nature of spatial data? Whether our data are regularly based or irregularly based. I just preparing location map for our data. We could assess, evaluate the nature of our data and you have fortunately or unfortunately depending upon the nature of your background, you have different names 
for the nature of data. Ground-based versus air-based is one possible name attached to nature of data. Vector-based versus raster-based. Regular base versus irregular base, and then point base versus block base for pixel wise data. Of course, when you talk about ground base, sooner or later you will realize that you are talking about vector base data, or you are talking about irregular base data or you are talking about point data. When you are talking about air-based measurement, whether it could come from radar or satellite, raster base, regular base, block base, or typical name assigned to air-based measurement. By just preparing location map for your data, you could assess which part of the domain monitor sparsely and which part of the domain monitor densely. Unfortunately, in any geostatistical program like, like IGIS or GS library or whatever program that you have at your disposal, the program will try to assign color to each data point. And there is a legend connected to those colors. If you want to explore trend in your data, drift in your data, location map would help you spatially to decide whether your data contain any trend or not. If it happens that the color changes gradually as you move from north to south, or as you move from say, west to east, then that means you have some sort of non-stationarity in your data, which means that either your mean or your variance depends on spatial location, they are not constant. And then contour map, where you are familiar from topography map, it's another way to assess the degree of variability, spatial variability in your data. When your day contour map are quite dense, very near to each other, that means the degree of variation is quite high. If it happens that your contour map is quite sparse, very apart from each other, then that means that the degree of variation in that part of your study area is quite low. Symbol map, indicator map, or some other way to describe your data qualitatively. I recall when I did my PhD program research, I have to map depression storage over a typical plot, one meter by one meter which means if I pour water over my study area, which part of my study area would be covered by water and which part of my study area would not be covered by water. I have to map those areas. If you look at any book written on hydrology, engineering hydrology, you could barely see a single paragraph on depression storage. Even if I ask you what is depression storage, the only thing that you can say is charge duration. Nothing more than that. That took almost four years of my life to dig further into depression storage. And I, at that time, the name of RTIS was RTINFO, 90. And I have a chance to work with this program, not on Microsoft. Currently, nowadays, RTIS can be executed using Microsoft. 
at that time, almost 25 years ago, you can only execute this program on Linux or Unix. And I recall at that time I used a module so-called grid to map at first try to delineate depression storage digitally, not graphically. And then as soon as I delineated the depression storage, which pixels belong to depression and which pixels that is not does not depend it does not belong to depression. I have to ask for help the program to denote pixels belonging to depression with one and pixels which do not belong to depression by zero. And that zero one would differentiate between pixels belonging to depression and pixels that switch that don't belong to depression. And then we publish uh, our first paper extracted from dissertation on journal hydrology. And uh, in that paper, we try to address the impact of spatial resolution on mapping depression storage. It's quite interesting for you to justify why hydrology textbook cannot quantify depression storage. Out of your surprise, we did realize that mapping depression storage is scale dependent. If you look at, I would like to talk about the scale dependent a little bit more. If you look at this part of this blackboard, you will consider it to be homogeneous, yes or no? But if you change your glass, instead of having nothing on your eye, try to have a better resolution instrument to look at this part of the table. Then out of your surprise and my, and my surprise, as soon as you change your glass to look at this part of this blackboard, you will see that it is heterogeneous. What does that mean? That means depression storage is quite grid or scale dependent. It depends upon the grid spacing. If you monitor the surface with 3 mm by 3 mm grid spacing, then you are going to have a huge number of depression storage. If you start to increase the grid spacing, then the number of depression storage or the surface will decrease. And it's quite interesting for you to acknowledge the fact that if you map your number of depression on y-axis and the grid spacing on x-axis, the relationship is going to be linear. And this linearity implies that the relationship between number of depression storage and grid spacing is parallel, fractal geometry. And then when it comes to surface area at pool point, volume of depression at pool point, maximum depth of depression at pool point, again they have a parallel relationship with each other. Look at regular fractal that you are familiar with. Depression storage are irregular, random fractal. When it comes to regular fractal, look at these three relationships. Perimeter of the circle, area of the circle, and volume of the circle. 
When you want to use either of these equations, you will not ask yourself whether your cell case is small or large, yes or no. No. This equation, these relationships are very applicable to any cell case. For line object, the power is 1. For area object, the power is 2. And for volume, the power is 3. And when it comes to a paper that I shared with you in my interview with a newspaper magazine, so-called Fesh, you will have a chance to read that interview, we try to connect topographic variation with the day of judgment. You might have a chance to read the entire paper where we try to extract that paragraph to our conclusion section saying that these are regular fractals and then when it comes to irregular or random fractal like depression and storage, again the relationship is power. This is power. If you call any of these to be, say, Y, and then this is part. For line object, you could have this. For aerial object, you could have this. And then when it comes to irregular or random fractal, this power here is not a whole number, integer number, like 1, 2, 3. When it comes to random fractal, this V here is less than 1, or greater than 1, depending upon the nature of the object. You have another item in your hydraulic force, and that has something to do with Vs. Result. Again, the overall relationship is this. Y is going to be your discharge, X is going to be the height on your beer. You could have this, where the power is 1. This beer is called Chipoletti beer, where the power is 1. You could have Q equal to AH to the power of 1.5, and this corresponds to rectangular beer. And then you could have Q equal to A h to the power of 2. This corresponds to parabolic here. And then you could have A h to the power of 2.5 when your beer is ready to try it. And when it comes to proportional wear or chipotle wear, we have a situation like this.
if this chip will let be aware the relationship between discharge and height on your beer is one. These are four types of beer where the name the relationship between two variables is covered. We could have experimental, omnidirectional, or directional covariance function. These two measures are measure of similarity. And then we have experimental either omnidirectional or directional variable function. Today, 
I would like to tell you one more thing which we did not cover on Monday, and that is where this equation is coming from. Remember, when we started to touch on SHS that the plot, we considered two types of data. And it's quite important to differentiate between SHS that the plot for regularly based data, SHS that the plot for irregularly. Because of the regularity in raster-based data, we prefer to start touching on each scatter plot for raster-based data. You have to freeze two things when you want to prepare each scatter plot. The very, the very first thing that you have to freeze is the gear spacing. You have to freeze grid spacing, and then you have to freeze the direction to be able to go for preparing H scatter plot for a particular direction. And then the next question that you would like to raise is this: Could it be possible to extract a single number from each scatter plot? We could have. Numerous issues that they brought for a typical raster based data. What do I mean by numerous? By numerous, I mean when you want to freeze the grid spacing, you may want to freeze the grid spacing by H, or 2H, or 3H, 4H, and so on. And then as soon as you freeze the spatial grid spacing, then you can count the number of pairs in a particular direction whose separation distance corresponds to H, or 2H, or 3H, and so forth. And then, could it be possible to extract a single number from each SS scatter plot? And those single numbers which could be extracted from each scatter plot correspond to either measure of similarity or measure of variability. And when it comes to raster-based data set, we show that as you increase the grid spacing, two important things will happen. Please pay attention. As you increase the grid spacing, two important things will happen. The first thing is that as you increase grid spacing, the number of pairs associated with each H scatter block will decrease. If you have a series of raster based data, This is a typical map for raster-based data. And this is the grid spacing. 
which is the same as this. If you are asked to tell your audience this question, what is the number of pairs whose separation distance is h and they are in east-west direction? This is east-west direction. This is west. And this is east. And then that is the grid spacing, which is the same as this. If you want to count the number of pairs whose separation distance is h, and they are located along west this direction, this is going to be the first pair, this is going to be the second pair, and this is going to be the third pair. And then you can go ahead all together nine pairs. You have nine pairs in west east direction whose separation distance is h. Now, if I use different color and try to delineate pairs whose separation distance is to h. That's going to be the first pair whose separation distance is to h and it is aligned in east west direction. And this is going to be the second pair. Again, this is As you can see, if you increase the separation distance in west-east direction to 2h, then the number of pairs is going to be 6 in a set of 9. If you keep going, use different color and talk about pairs whose separation distance is 3h. You could realize that if you fix your separation distance to be 3h and they are aligned in east-west direction, then you are going to have three pairs. What do I mean by h scatter plot? You have to, when either of one h h spacing, 2h, 3h, and so on, you have to assign name to each pair when it comes to their numerical values. Of course, you know for sure that you have a pixel value at this point, pixel value at this point, pixel value at this point, pixel value at this point. And then if you want to map a shift plot for say H situation, then you have to tell your audience, you have to connect this point to this point, and then call this tail, this point H, the numerical value of the attribute under consideration at P will be mapped on X axis, the numerical value of the attribute under consideration at H will be mapped on Y axis. What if the separation distance is zero? Can you tell me the number of pairs the separation distance is zero? This one. No, it's uh, number the number of points. The number of points. 4 times 3, 12. If the separation distance is 0, then you have altogether 12 pairs. And quite interesting to realize that if you map your pairs for the case when h is equal to zero, they will correspond to the bisector of the first quadrant in sort of a What's the Then uh, again we are going to have 
a situation where we have to consider Release their attention. If you are talking about non-directional, then that not, does not mean that you have uh, to consider both this direction and this direction. It may happen that you have a daily operation in this direction as well, with that separation distance. But if you want to have a quick answer to your question, then for the case when you have omnidirectional experimental either covariance or correlation or wiregram, the number of pairs with separation distance is 3H is going to be 3. Because in this direction we have no pairs with separation distance is 3H. It may or may not depending upon the geometry. Could find pairs whose separation distance is 3H in a different direction. Look at No. Uh, if you consider this to be your first pair, then it makes no sense to put it vice versa, call this A T, call this T. In a sense, when you want to specify the direction, it's quite important to put west and then this. By putting this W here and E here, your vector should be directed from east to west please, not from east to west. See, it's not possible to write for the row your vector in this way. This is east to west. You have to draw your vector from west to east. If you draw your vector from west to east, then that's going to be your tail. That's going to be your head. This would be mapped on x-axis. This would be, should be mapped on y-axis. Therefore, no, uh, you could not change the order, head to head and then head to only one. And because of this, you argue that the distance matrix will be symmetric. If you take this point and then find the distance from this point to every point in your data map, then when it comes to this point and then you have to know the distance from this point to every data point then it may happen that you have a symmetric matrix not asymmetric matrix which means that the diagonal element is zero because the distance between the point and the point itself is zero and the off diagonal element is symmetric they are the same which means that if your D I J is equal to D J I and then D I I for distance matrix is zero. The second happening in your H scatter plot if you start to increase the separation distance is this. When your separation distance is zero, the bandwidth is zero. Because every data point will be along by sector of the first quarter. If you increase the separation distance, then the bandwidth, the fluctuation of data point along or around the bisector will increase. Do you know what I'm saying? For zero separation distance, the bandwidth is zero. As you increase the separation distance, the bandwidth will increase. And then in our previous lecture, we tried to raise this question. Could it be possible to extract a single number from each H scatter plot? And then we tried to answer that question for both regularly based data and irregularly based data. 
Today, at first, I would like to tell you where this equation is coming from. Let me start with again, if this is your y at say s i, this is going to be your y at s plus h because you will increase the spatial location to s plus h and then if you consider a Cartesian coordinate system where you map your attribute under consideration at head here, the attribute under consideration at head here. This is H scattered like when the separation distance is H. And then you have, this is the bisector of first quadrant, from here to here, it's the same as from here to here. Perhaps this line would be drawn in such a way that the angle could be or should be by this angle should be 45 and then you have a number of points for your H scattered plot fluctuating around this line. What does that mean? If you take a typical data point such as this point, from here to here is y at s i a, and from here to here is y at s i plus h. Repeat this for other data point here. Then the question is, If you want to have a quantitative measure for these bandwidths, how could you proceed to establish this quantitative measure? Before C, I shall understand here. اگر چون که شما شروع بکنید سپریشن دیستنس رو افزارش بکنید برای زیرو سپریشن دیستنس پهنایبان به تو صفر چون تمام رو باید تو مون امزاد رو به افر برد میگیرن با افزایش سپریشن دیستنس چون تو هر ایچه سفر بلاتی دو تو چیز بیریزه سپریشن دیستنس جهت درش اگر چند چه دایرکشن اگر دایرکشن ها رو نخواهید همونی دایرکشن ها رو باشه اقلا دیگه جهت هم فیلیز نیست تو هر جهتی که مد نظرتون باشه فعلا هم داریم نمل ریگولر بیس دیتا صحبت میکنیم بعد نمل ریگولر بیس هم جلسه قبل نکاتی رو گفتیم هم ترم قبل همین ترم هم باز برای ریگولر هم صحبت های داشته سآلی که من میخوام بپرستم و دوست دارم یک کمی ما نوش بدم این رابطه که ما اینجا نوشتیم از کجا به دست آمده میجرا بریفی Could it be possible for we as civil engineers to consider each data point to be a weight and try to obtain the moment of each weight around this axis, the second moment, of course not the first moment, and then take the average of that moment. If the dispersion, the bandwidth, is quite large, 
when the average second moment of inertia is going to be large, if the data point are fluctuating near to this line, then the average moment is quite small. Assume that this data point here are weights and then try to multiply each weight by the second or the square of this distance. Try to quantitatively compute the bandwidth by summing the i to the power of two. Is Wearing each distance to the power of two. In fact, the best video. No, that is the new sort of weapon. Trying to square each distance, perpendicular distance, and then divide by the, the total number. I will show that this relationship is. And this is a measure of variability. As you increase the separation distance, the bandwidth will increase. If you decrease the separation distance, then the bandwidth will decrease. If you have zero separation distance, then every point will be along this line and the bandwidth is zero. If you increase the separation distance, then these measures, these dr will increase, and their square will increase, and then you are going to have increase in your bandwidth. How would it be possible to convert this to this equation? If you this angle is 45 Therefore, this angle will be 45 as well. And then, from here to here, is y at si plus h minus y at si. Okay? Because from here to here is this, from here to here is this, because from here to here is the same as from here to here. Therefore, from here to here is y times y, from here to here y, and then here is the first for increment. Okay? And then if you consider this right triangle you can say di is equal to this distance times cosine of 45 because cosine of this angle Which is 45 is equal to this divided by the R. This is for 90 degrees. Okay? Therefore, DI can be written as. Y at S I plus H K 
minus 4h is really doesn't matter minus y at si you have to multiply this by cosine of 45 to get this distance dr and then raise this to the power of 2 plug it here cosine of 45 is uh, square root of 2 divided by 2 times y at s i plus h minus y h y s raise this to the power of 2 and then plug it out there d i to the power of 2 is equal to 1 over 2 If you plug this value out there, you will find this. Remember that in our virtual class, please remember that in our virtual class, <coughs> we Consider the case where both your mean and variance or variable, and then in that case, we show that gamma at S i S j plus R S i S j. is equal to R sub S I S J plus I have to put two here and two here in S I R sub S J S J plus M S I minus M and J. Remember this relationship that we have in our virtual class. When your mean is variable, when, you, when your variance is variable, the relationship between variogram and covariance function is going to be this. If it happens that your mean is constant but your variance is not constant, this will cancel out. Because m is constant, then this will cancel out. You are left with this. If it happens that your mean is constant as well as your variance is constant, then you can uh, replace this with this, it will become 2, and you can divide both sides by 2 to get gamma plus r equal to r at 0. Because the separation distance between these two points is 0. The separation distance between these two points is 0 as well. Then if your variance is constant, if your mean is constant, then gamma plus r is equal to r plus Remember that we argue that either gamma or R could have a three synonyms associated with them. Your measure of variability or measure of similarity 
could be a function of absolute location. In that case, you have to specify six arguments in 3D to specify either from or R. If your measure of variability or measure of similarity is a function of absolute location, then that is called a dead end in geostatistics. You can go nowhere if your gamma or R is a function of absolute location. The next level of complexity is to have gamma or R a function of separation vector. Please pay attention, separation vector has nothing to do with stationarity or non-stationarity. You could have a stationary function, random function, where your gamma or R is a function of separation vector. The next level of simplicity, or for that matter complexity, is to have gamma and R a function of separation distance. Now, I would like to raise another question. If you open any textbook written on Jewish statistics, you will notice that they define variable function to be variance of the first interval. In another, book, in other words, under what condition this relationship is the same as this relationship? If you open any textbook written on geostatistics, sooner or later you will notice that they define variable function two times variable to be variance of the first interval. There is no two here. But today, we try to dig further into this relationship, and we did realize that a measure of bandwidth is going to be the average of the square of these what you need to do is to raise each distance to the power of 2 and then find the average. And then we show that this relationship is this, using this idea. And now we would like to raise this question again. And we did answer this question while we talked about definition of variable. Under what condition this relationship is the same as this? If you, now the answer, if you define variance of a typical random variable to be expected value of x to the power of 2 minus expected value of x to the power of 2. That is definition of variance. Then you know for sure that here your x is going to be the first increment. What you need to do is to replace this x with this and then you are going to have this variance of the first increment
is going to be expected value of y at si minus y at sj to the power of 2 this is x to the power of 2 minus expected value of If you want to tell your audience how will it be possible to have this relationship to be the same as this relationship, you have to assume that this part is zero, which means that your mean has to be constant. Because the expected value of y at si is m at s i, the expected value of y at s j is m at s j. If m at s i is the same as m at s j, this will cancel out. Then the definition of expectation is to replace this expectation with summation. You could replace this by saying 1 over n sub k summation i from 1 to n sub k and then because I need we have one index for the argument of this summation. I will change this to y at s i plus h minus y at s j. Excuse me. That is how you could connect this definition to that definition. And for both of them, you have to put these two here. Do you follow me? If you want to figure out under what condition you could consider this to be equivalent to this or this equivalent to this, you have to have constant mean to be able to make these two equations equivalent. This part has to be zero. Please pay attention. These two here, Mr. Zoyri, has nothing to do with this two here. But these two here has something to do with this two here. And that is why I try to use appropriate editorial stuff to differentiate between this E and this E. This E here has nothing to do with this two. However, this E here has something to do with this two. Here you have to raise these to the power of two and then take expectation. Here you have to take expectation of this and then raise them to the power of two. Here, if you raise this to the power of 2, you could still have value, random number. And then you will take expectation. However, here, if you take expectation of this, you have a crisp number, not random value. Do you know what I'm saying? Here, if you take expectation, you are getting a crisp number, no random variable, and then raise this to the power of 2. Here the argument is a crisp number. And then you will raise this crisp number to the power of 2. Here the argument will be a random variable. And then you will take expectation of this answer. Can you see the difference between where you have to put the power? Any question? Mr. Sobele Mir Ahmadi. Is it enough?
یه سوال داشتم اون نقطه های کلام ما داریم مثل با ردیف های پایین و همیشه خطی دایکشنال کلان یه تنبستی که شما رسی میکنیم آره نیم ویار تاکنیم با ریگلر دیتا وی هاوی پسیبیلیتی تو هاوی ریگلر دیتا سی؟ دایکشنال ویشتر زیستی where the data is no longer ready. That's the same data that we have in the same way. We have a point in the control line. We have a point in the same way. How about remote distance data? If you have remote distance data, then your data is arrested. Remote distance data is not arrested. Remote distance data is not arrested. But you are right. You raise in your Bachelor of Science Master of Science and then your PhD, you are more or less familiar with lateral based data. It might be a good chance for both to the student coming from geological science and or as well as student coming from civil engineering department to start touching on remote distance data. Try to utilize or get benefits from remote distance data. It will add another dimension to your research. Now, Mr. Mir Ahmadi may want to know if our data are vector-based as opposed to being raster based how could it be possible to prepare edge scatter plot and then diagram function, covariance function and correlation function. In order to make it totally different from what I said in my previous lecture on Monday, I would like to tell you how to prepare histogram in a statistics. Preparing histogram in statistics is very similar to preparing variogram for vector-based data in geostatistics. If you want to prepare histogram for your data in statistics, how would you proceed? You are doing a series of numbers. And the spatial location is not important for them because you want to go for univariate distribution. The very first item that you have to consider to prepare histogram is to delineate the maximum and minimum value in history. Delineate the minimum and maximum value. The first step. If you want to correspond this step in histogram preparation to the first step in variogram preparation, in variogram preparation, the first step is to delineate the maximum separation distance. Maximum separation distance in geostatistics is very similar to range in histogram. What is the definition of range? Maximum minus minimum. Therefore, the very first step in Joe's statistics to prepare experimental diagram is to delineate the maximum separation distance in your vector-based data. For that, you need to compute the distance matrix and when it comes to maximum separation distance, try to write a Fortran program, MATLAB program or whatever program that you can imagine to delineate the maximum value in your distance matrix. Therefore, the first step is to delineate the maximum separation distance or L maximum. 
Now, the second step in diagram in histogram preparation is to discretize the range into a number of classes. Remember in histogram blocking preparation, you have to delineate maximum and minimum values, subtract maximum from minimum to find the range, and then try to discretize the range into a number of class And you are familiar from statistics that if you want to discretize the range, you have an empirical relationship. What is that empirical relationship? The number of class interval P is equal to 1 plus 3 times 3 log of number of data. That is the relationship to connect number of class interval to number of data in histogram plot preparation. All you need to do is Say you have 13, 3, 0 data, plug it here, find the logarithm of 30, multiply by 3.3, add it to 1 to find P. And this is empirical. You cannot justify this on physical or theoretical ground. Unfortunately, this subjectivity is very applicable to discretizing either the maximum separation distance or two-thirds of maximum separation distance. Here, in instead of discretizing the maximum separation distance, we try to discretize two-thirds of maximum separation distance. And the reason for this inclusion, two-thirds of maximum separation distance, has something to do with the number of pairs toward the end of class intervals. As you notice here, if you take your separation distance to be h or 0, then the number of pairs is going to be equal to the number of data points. If you increase the separation distance to h, then you are going to have, say, 3 times 3, 9 data pairs. If you increase your separation distance to 2h, then you are going to have 6 pairs. If you increase your separation distance to 3h, then you are going to have 3 pairs. Which means, if you increase the separation distance, the number of pairs assigned to each class interval will decrease. If this is your maximum separation distance and you collapse it to two thirds, therefore it's going to be this. And then you would like to discretize this interval into a number of class intervals. What I am saying we prefer not to discretize this distance, but this distance, because if we discretize, discretize this distance, the number of pairs allocated to the last class interval will be very minimal, will be small, a small number, just like what we have out there. For zero separation distance, we have none, 12 data pairs. And then it will increase to 9, and then 6, and then 3, and then nothing. Then you have 4 edge separation distance. Here, we should take a typical separation distance for class interval to be k. And this is the first class interval, this is the second class interval, third, and so forth. And if you consider this to be your final class interval, the name of this is going to be P. 
the number of pairs corresponding to class interval number one is n one. The number of pairs whose separation distance will be less than this, greater than zero. When you want to count the number of pairs corresponding to class interval two, you have to say, I'm looking for separation distance whose numerical value is greater than this, less than this. And then if you call this to be H lower limit, this H upper limit, then for typical class interval like K, the number of pairs whose separation distance is greater than this, less than this, is going to be N sub K. And then when it comes to this N plus N plus N and X K plus 1, and then you are here, the number of pairs is going to be this. You can easily show that n sub k k from 1 to p the total number of pairs over the entire data set is equal to n and n minus 1 divided by 2 Would it be possible to check this formula? Or perhaps I would say this formula when you have two points. If you have two points, what would be the total number of pairs? One. If you plug two here, it will become one. If you have three data points, here, graphical representation for the case when you have two data points is one better. If you have three data points, then you have three pairs. If n is equal to four, then you have to put n times four minus one divided by two, that will give you six. And if you have four points, then pair number one, Pair number two, pair number three, pair number four, five, six. And you keep go, keep going. Now, maximum separation distance, two thirds of maximum separation distance. This here ties this to a number of zero. You have two choice. To this here ties this separation distance. What are those two choices? It is very similar to what you have in histogram. You, in histogram, you could have equal class interval or you could have variable class interval with different objective. If you assume that your class interval is the same, equal class interval, which means this distance is the same as this distance, this distance is the same as this distance, then the number of pairs allocated to each interval will be different. You could define a different scenario. In the second choice that you might consider is to consider variable class interval, but the number of pairs allocated to each interval is the same.
Let's see if we have this distance and we want to have two class interval with equal class interval. When it comes to two class intervals, we have to subdivide the data into two pieces, the separation distance of two pieces. And depending upon the topology, the network configuration, the number of pairs in each interval will be different. What if we want to have two intervals with equal number of pairs? How could it be possible to proceed? Can you imagine? You would like to have two class intervals and the number of pairs in each interval to be the same. What you need to do is to, in order to find the class interval, the demarcation point, is to sort out your separation distance from minimum to maximum and then find the median. Half of your separation distance will be belonging to the first interval, the other half will be allocated to the second interval. What do I mean by median? Imagine that you have separation distance number one to be two meter, five meter, seven meter, nine meter, twelve meter. These are five separation distance in your data. And uh, under what condition you are going to have five separation distance? What would be the number of data points? And to the power of two, minus n, minus 10. You have to solve this equation and hopefully you are going to get an integer number. If not, that means this file is not applicable. This is a quadratic function. And you have to solve this for n to find the number of data point to give you five pairs. Assuming that it is applicable, then you would like to tell your audience what would be the class interval. You have to demarcate this into this part. This is uh, the first interval and this is the second interval. And the number of pairs allocated to each interval is the same. No doubt, you will say, what happened to this 7 here? You have to figure out how to discretize the separation distance into two class interval with equal pairs. What would be my objective to play with these numbers? It is very similar to history. You could draw a histogram in different ways. Even though I introduced this equation for the number of class intervals, but this equation is empirical. It is not theoretical. It is not based on physical ground. It is totally empirical. And then as soon as you define your class interval, you have to count the number of instances in each interval for histogram plotting. And then, sooner or later, the instructor, the faculty member will tell you, please do not choose class intervals whereby you have data being wanted. Where should they be allocated? You should not 
this can pass the range into class intervals so that the number of data points will be just on the interval, not belonging to the inside of it. The Farsi, when you have to say that this program is going to be class interval or type of coding, but class interval, you can't talk about it, you can't talk about it, you can't talk about it. منشه از داده سرگردان چیه؟ یعنی داده این نداشت باشه که درست روی مرز بیافته که ندونی تو این گروه بزرده شد تو این گروه بشمنه بشه We did write a number of papers touching on this point If you want to prepare experimental variable If you want to prepare directional experimental variable for a vector-based data, you have a huge number of scenarios to consider. And the question is, what would be the best variable which could be representative of your data? Today, there is no answer for this question. If you find the answer to this question, then you are going to get the 20 grade. Peace. There is no answer to this question that you are going to define the best situation. Which means that from as early as uh, delineating the maximum separation distance, finding the two thirds of this, then when it comes to this equal interval. You could have a trade-off between high number of intervals versus low number of intervals. If you take P to be quite high, then the number of pairs allocated to each pair will be quite small. It may happen that you have no pairs in a number of intervals for irregular space data. What would be the trade-off between low values of P, number of class intervals, versus high values of P, assuming that your class interval is equal? You could delineate papers written on network design, not for the purpose of getting average value right, but trying to design a topology to get this value. Try to delineate stations, rain gauge station, thermometer station, evaporation station, whatever station that you can imagine, to get this value. You could delineate papers to meet this objective. Unfortunately, there is no written document to tell you that if you are given a single series of data, the best discretization is going to be this, and then go ahead and find the experimental omnidirectional value. The number of pairs in this interval is n1, and then this interval corresponds to edge scatter. And then when it comes to this interval, this interval corresponds to two edges scattered. But please pay attention. When you are out there, regular data set, the separation distance between each pair is the same. But when it comes to irregular data set, the separation distance for the first interval, all you know is that the number of pairs in the edge is n1. But you may have n one separation distance, which are not the same. When it comes to this interval, you have n two separation distance. Again, in this n two separation distance are not the same; they are very different. Then you could use this relationship to find gamma for each interval. In my Monday session. And in my previous lecture last semester, in my last semester, I touched on three measures for computation of H. Computation of gamma is this. You have to use this relationship. 
When it comes to computation of h for each interval, you have five scenarios. What are those five scenarios? Let me put it here. The very first scenario is to compute the separation distance in each interval using arithmetic mean. This is the first possibility. Computation of separation distance, representative separation distance for each, each interval using this formula. And of course, because I is defined internally, you have to define K except for K from 1 to T. That is the first possibility, to compute the representative separation distance in each interval. The second possibility is to compute representative separation distance using harmonic mean. That is how to compute harmonic mean. Hold it. H1, 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 H
have to sort out this data and then find the meaning. This is the fourth possibility. And then the fifth possibility is to say S of K is equal to S of L for interval K plus H of L U H of U K my U minus excuse me U K L K. If you simplify this relationship, because this will be factored out, simplified with this, you are going to get one half. H of L U S of U K plus H of U K. The complexity of diagram modeling has something to do with these possibilities that you have. At first, you have to decide on the number of intervals, and this is up to you. And then you have to decide on the representative separation distance for each interval. And then as soon as you make this decision, you have a table like this. This is your H of K, and this is your normal H of K. For a variety of reasons, you cannot use this table to go for a stimulation. And in this case, I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. بعد از شش ماه رو نتفر بیزاین کار میکرد بعد از شش ماه اومد گفته شقای آبدینی من واریانس منفی میگیرم خب توضیح بده چی کار کردی که واریانس منفی میگیرم خب معلوم که من تقمیدام رو بر اساس این کتبت تنظیم کرد طبیعی یکی یک داکومنتی بهتون دادیم موقع که کلاس های مجازی داشتیم عنوان این هستش برای گرمداد پی دی ایف فکر میکنم که در صفحاتش هم نسبتا زیاد The number of pages is 10 The Each page is allocated to a number of admissible covariance or variable function. Then I will share a paper with you, a very interesting paper. It was written in 1984 in Water Resources Research, this paper. It was written by George Christopus on the problem of permissible covariance and diagram model. And in this paper, written in Water Resources Research, you have a chance to cover the entire course with this paper. The attractive feature of this paper is to tell you how to connect frequency analysis. Converting spatial data to frequency data, mapping data from frequency domain to spatial domain and vice versa, to be able to touch on admissibility of variable function and covariance function. You cannot focus on these tables to go for estimation. Let me see if I have time. No, I have no other additional time. On Monday, I will try to tell you how to proceed to represent this paper by a theoretical variable. And I will share this paper with you, written in Water Resources Research, 
to be able to connect what I'm going to say on Monday and the reason why you have to convert this experimental variable to theoretical variable. As possible, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going to